All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the WebGL Birds of Feather session. My name is Ken Russell, I work at Google, and I'm the chair of the WebGL Working Group and Cronus Organization. We have an awesome lineup for you today. 12 action-packed WebGL demos showing the latest uh, rendering technologies using WebGL for everything from medical visualization to physically based illumination to uh, terrain rendering to globe rendering. You're going to be amazed. So uh, with that, I give you Patrick Cozy from uh, University. Analytical graphics and occasionally affiliated with uh, UPenn. So, my name is Patrick. I'm a software developer at AGI, and we've been using WebGL to develop an open source uh, virtual global map. Then, I'm going to show you guys a few demos today. Okay, so what we're looking at here is about 900 satellites. These are all the active, unclassified satellites in our database, and we're propagating them server side and we're distributing them down to the client. Um, the ones in blue have line of sight to a satellite or to a facility on the ground. And we're doing a uh, same thing you do with streaming video where we're, we're uh, prefetching and we're batching them together. Uh, on the rendering side, we're doing a single draw call for all the satellites, uh, just batching them up and then expanding them in the vertex shader. Um, there's these sensors down here that show kind of camera fields of view where the satellites can see. And the intersection of those and the ground is done in the fragment shader. And then finally, for picking, we just do standard color buffer picking where you can get more information from the particular satellite. All done in WebGL. It's very, actually very light on the GPU. Okay. Uh, the next one I want to show. Here, this is a reconnaissance mission for UAV flying in the Persian Gulf. So here we see the Global Hawk and some ships, and that's maintaining downlink to a comm satellite up top. And then this, the, um, excuse me, the, uh, Atmosphere here is shown on the GPU Gems 2 work. And then we can convert this to what we call Columbus view. So this is like a two and a half D view. Um, same API, it's just one line of code to do the morph. And we can also morph it into 2D. And this is done in the vertex shader. So this isn't like, you know, render to texture then morph, morph is here. Everything is done uh, in the vertex shader. So it's actually animating as it's morphing. So it's cool that you can see WebGL we're using it for both 3D and 2D, and I think we'll see that later today uh, with the Google Maps demo. Okay, so the final demo I want to show, this is uh, experimental, this is still a work in progress. Uh, our code is on GitHub, but we haven't posted any demos yet publicly. Uh, but this is our train engine, and here we're streaming train imagery from Esri servers. Uh, the train is 90 meters for the world and 3 meters for the US. The imagery from this point, from this view is 1 meter. Uh, we stream down the height field, and in a web worker, we reproject it from Web Mercator WC4. We convert positions and texture coordinates in the web worker, and then we use hierarchical level detail, defrosting and calling, and inclusion calling to select the tiles for rendering. From this view, we're selecting 42 tiles, each is about 32,000 triangles, all sharing the same index buffer, however, uh, it's not optimized for vertex cache yet. Uh, so we're resulting about 1.3 million triangles that we're drawing per frame, and we get about 25 to 30 frames a second on my card here, which is a 260N, which is very similar to like a GeForce 9 series on desktop. Uh, so it's very, very interactive. I'm driving around. Uh, and we're actually drawing, from that initial point of view, we're doing amazing 336 textures, 256 by 256 textures, which is way too many, and we gotta optimize it. But it just shows you that, you know, we're still getting really good really good performance. Okay, um, so finally, I just want to you know, thank the team. We have a big, uh, big team working on this. Everyone's very passionate about the web and very passionate about WebGL. And the code is, uh, is open source, so check it out on GitHub. And I'll be up front if you want to talk about WebGL or, or season later. Thank you. That's why we're learning at the next demo. There's a quick announcement. For those of you that would be interested, there's an IEEE CGNA. Uh, themed edition around 3D on the web uh, coming in the new year. Uh, I'm sharing an editorship with uh, Philip Suslan from the uh, University of Solomon. Uh, if you're interested to submit papers uh, to that, I'm very interested to, to talk to you. My email is up there. This will be on Kronos or the website or just come grab me during the event. It'll uh, be great to talk to you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, my name is Christian Sons from the German Research um, Institute for Artificial Intelligence. Um, and thanks for letting me present the XML 3D project. So maybe a short survey. Who of you likes programming shaders? Wow, yeah. So you're not my target audience. 
<laughs> I think you are the minority. The most people in the web community, they don't care about that. They want to program 3D web applications. And so we have a lot of nice frameworks popping up that lets you to program um, um, through the web application without the need to um, program shaders. And XML3D is one of those decorative approach. You can use the Java um, scene graph, JavaScript scene graph, but you can also use the DOM API. Well, the DOM API is quite nice. Um, every web developer knows how to uh, use that with jQuery and everything else. And uh, so XML3D is similar to X3DOM, but what we will see later, um, one of the prototype uh, platforms for a decorative approach um, within a W3C community group. And that a uh, um, decorative approach is not necessarily boring. Um, I should show this demo. Uh, so what you see here is just the whole scene is inside the web uh, website, inside the DOM. Um, and we have everything, we have like, uh, we have skinning, we have like three people here, completely skinned with 80 bones, with uh, like 60,000 um, vertices, completely currently in JavaScript. But we have a data flow approach, that means the whole uh, processing is also described decoratively. And we have uh, an alternative um, implementation where we use RiverTrail uh, to implement this. Uh, RiverTrail is an approach to use uh, parallel JavaScript based on OpenCL. Another approach is, of course, to, to use the GPU to, uh, to, to use the skin. Uh, but we can really choose uh, depending on what hardware is available if we use the CPU or if we use um, the uh, river trail approach or if we map our, um, our data flow to, um, uh, to, uh, to, to the vertex shader stage. And uh, maybe as the last uh, thing, um, I'll show how easy it is now to, to program a 3D application. So you see here, um, this is a collision map that's uh, used in this, uh, in this demo. So you see the rooms of the museum, and as soon as I come, uh, it's loaded to the HTML canvas, and it reads out the position where I am in the museum, and as soon as I come close to, uh, to some of those uh, blue bubbles just give me a JavaScript call back and I can change here the text or anything else. So it's, uh, and this, this has done a student who had no 3D experience at all. So it's really easy now to really um, program new kinds of uh, web applications. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I am Ben Minnick, I'm an engineer at Google, and I have a couple cool, hopefully 20% projects that I've been working on, um, that all kind of combine together, uh, focusing around game development. Uh, so basically what I want to see is something a little bit lower level than 3.js for the web, something more akin to XNA, uh, and that means content pipeline, a framework for doing really high fidelity stuff, like 3D positional audio, really nice wrappers around WebGL, uh, networking. Uh, and then I wanted a game to prove that you could actually do it. Uh, so this is not Minecraft, but it is a game uh, that I built on this system. Uh, so this right here is actually playing multiplayer uh, over these amazing cellular connections. Uh, so I support all kind of mouse lock and fancy stuff like that. Uh, this does usually run at 60 frames a second. Uh, and it's got an entity replication system over the network, so it's doing client-side prediction and interpolation, just like an actual real game does. Um, and so James down there is playing over an ATT connection, and this is Verizon, and it's working pretty good. Um, the world is infinite and fully deformable, so you can kind of place blocks and kill blocks and stuff like that. Um, there's no collision detection, so you can fly through the world. Um, but it is infinite. And some of the neat things about this is that the server and the client are both implemented in pure JavaScript. So it's written on top of the closure library, but it really doesn't matter. Um, and the server can actually be compiled to run in a web worker as well as on Node.js. So this example right here, the server's running on Node.js on some little uh, vShell host that I have. Uh, so yeah, so basically uh, there's a content system that's under this that's like a build system that can do a whole bunch of fun things. So you can have an audio editor open um, and be editing, say, the uh, dirt sound effect. Um, and as soon as you save that effect, the content system will pick up the change. It'll stitch all of your different sound effects into a sound bank, convert that to MP3, uh, and then notify every player of the game that the content has changed and it will reload automatically. Uh, which means you get very tight feedback on your content pipeline there. Um, and it can be extended to anything. So I can do that with textures, I can do it with shaders. Uh, I'll run the textures through things like PNG Crunch and PNG Quant. Uh, the shaders will run through the GLSL compiler and get optimized. Uh, and all
all of it kind of comes through on the web uh, in a very web-like way. Uh, I don't know if I can reload really this network. Uh, it loads instantaneously. It's about four network requests of about 100k uh, combined for everything. Uh, it's using unified JavaScript and all. Um, and it, it just feels kind of like what a game on the web should feel like. Uh, so I've got the projects. Um, uh, so the project and everything is all on GitHub. Uh, so if you go to github.com slash pandemic, uh, you will find uh, a lot of my other projects. Uh, Block Game is the Minecraft game, Games Framework is an XMA-like framework, uh, and Anvil Build is the build system. They're all kind of under active 20% work. Uh, and then finally, I wanted to show off a project that I worked on a while ago, uh, which is WebGL Inspector. Uh, so some of you have probably seen this before. Uh, it hasn't really been worked on too recently, but there's some announcements coming soon where there will be some of this work integrated into the Chrome developer tools. Um, until then, you can go get the extension on the Chrome Web Store uh, and play around with it. Uh, it basically is a G-debugger or a PIX, but for WebGL. Anyway, go check it out. <laughs> it basically, the, the cool features that, that you should play with uh, are the ability to inspect individual pixels. This is right in uh, some Q3BSP. Um, you can kind of get traces from entire frames, and if you click on one of the pixels on the right-hand side over there, uh, it'll actually show you a full trace of every draw call that contributed to that pixel, um, which can be really useful for identifying draw issues in your scene, why something isn't drawing, why a color isn't right, why your blend loads are wrong. Uh, and it's just kind of really handy. Hi. My name is Juan. I'm also an engineer at Google. Um, uh, for a long time, I've been working on web search, but uh, you may, if you're familiar with uh, Google Body, which was a Google Ads project, uh, late 2010, 2011, um, I worked on I worked on a pretty important piece of infrastructure there, which was the mesh compression. So, uh, unfortunately, I won't get to that. But I will. I did open source the project, uh, particularly the mesh compression part. And uh, for a change of pace, I'm going to have a very unimpressive demo. <laughs> Hopefully, it's for. Uh, oh, wait, here it comes. This is a good demonstration of a slow internet connection. <laughs> <laughs> Always have a backup. <laughs> there. there we go. All right. So this isn't uh, this isn't like super impressive because there's no like fancy shading going on uh, or anything like that. But um, what we did for Google Body was we had this problem where we had a ton of geometry and we didn't really we couldn't figure out a good way to load it very efficiently. Uh, so what I did was I came up with a simple mesh compression format um, and uh, the details of which I can't really get into in in five minutes uh, five five minutes. But uh, the, the gist is, is that the browser already has a bunch of things that kind of like look like the building blocks for compressors. Uh, you can sort of think about UTF-8 text compression as a form of a variable length integer encoding. And of course, uh, all HTTP traffic which should be transmitted using GZIP. So uh, between the two of those, you can uh, you, you basically can get very, very, very tight, uh, progressively downloadable uh, geometry. So uh, compared to other approaches, it's you basically get binary-like performance but you can also uh, stream, you can also pipeline the decoding because you can respond to on progress events. You don't have to wait for an entire binary block to show up uh, and stuff like that. And since the data is compressed in the first place, you know, you don't, you're not really, it's not really an extra cost to uh, copy from, you know, a shrimp into a, uh, into a type array. Um, but, so a lot of the stuff I actually showed off at uh, SIGGRAPH last year, but uh, what I wanted to say was that uh, while I used to work on web search at Google, I'm actually, uh, I've actually converted over to a WebGL research project. And one of the things that I get to do is play with stuff like this. So uh, we actually, in a few days before I came over to SIGGRAPH, I actually improved the compression by about 30%, which is, you know, which is quite, a, quite a nice win. Um, but uh, let's see. Uh, I, let me see if I can get, the, get my URL back up. So the, the open source project is here, uh, WebGL Loader uh, at Google Code. Uh, this internet is being slow again. Um, but th this has a lot more information. Uh, also, I wrote chapter 30 in, uh, in uh, OpenGL Insights. <laughs> and uh, so that has a lot more 
detail. I go, I go into like the nitty gritty and quantify the, I really quantify all the improvements and stuff like that. Uh, here we go. And uh, there's live demos and, and such and, and code, and I think there are probably people in the audience I've uh, collaborated with. Uh, I'll be here, I'll be at the OpenGL off and at the OpenGL party, so if you run into me, I'll be happy to talk. Hey, so hello everyone, my name is Brandon Jones. I'm currently with Motorola Mobility, but by the end of the month I will be a Google employee on Ken Russell's GPU Chrome team. Which I'm very excited about. Um, and today I'm going to basically give you a blatant pitch for the Crunch Texture Compression Library. But I have pretty pictures to go along with it, so I'm sure you'll forgive me. Okay, so uh, what this is, is a uh, WebGL rendering using resources extracted from the iOS version of its software's range. This is not the desktop version, um, but it still is something that's fairly nice to look at. And uh, Rage is an on-rail shooter. You'll notice that I'm not actually um, directing it at all. It just follows a predetermined path through there. And this actually creates a really interesting performance characteristic, where as it's walking through the level, in order to get kind of the mega texture, virtual texturing style rendering that uh, you see in the full PC game, uh, it is continuously streaming down a set of 1024 by 1024 texture atlases that it then applies based on your distance to any given mesh. And we can kind of see that visualized here. If I turn off texturing, uh, you'll see that as we walk through the level, the different meshes, uh, what's being visualized here is the UV coordinates and they change as we move around it as the different textures get applied. So it's a very brute force, but fairly simple and really quite effective method. Um, one of the big problems with this, however, is that in this case, we've got um, something like 759 different JPEGs, which are all about 100, I think 157K uh, a piece. And while they're, well, 159K a piece uh, on average, and while they are pretty small on disk, they actually expand to about three megs in the GPU. And so this causes some performance issues. You'll see down here at the bottom, um, I have the upload time for each of these textures printing out to the console. This is just the time that it takes to complete the GL uh, text image 2D call. And you can see here that we're getting things like 16 milliseconds, 19 milliseconds, so on and so forth. And in the 60, uh, 60 hertz scenario, if you take 16 milliseconds for a single upload call, you have dropped at least one frame worth of rendering. And that's not something that's desirable. So we need to move away from an uncompressed image and into something better. Now, DXT provides good compression and it creates a much smaller um, memory footprint on the GPU and has faster uploads. But the DXT textures themselves on disk are actually larger on average than the JPEGs. They're about 192K as opposed to 159. And, you know, that's not a huge difference, but this is the web, and we want to go as fast as possible. We want to make it as small as possible. So, uh, one of the solutions that has come out is Rich uh, Gelbreit, I apologize if I pronounced that wrong, uh, created the Crunch Texture Compression System, which is a, another set of compression that sits on top of DXT. And uh, then Evan Parker from Google applied uh, the original C++ decompression library that he built uh, through EM Scripting, which is a C++ to JavaScript cross compiler, and was able to get that running in WebGL. So I can switch over to using crunch textures now. And um, You'll notice that at the bottom, we, we're now getting a separate set of, of numbers. One is the upload time, which is coming back as zero milliseconds, because the textures are actually a sixteenth the size of the JPEG in memory, which is great. But now decompressing, uh, sorry, restarting a little, uh, actually takes, uh, on some systems, it's about the same time as a JPEG decompressed, but in this case, it's actually worse. We're getting about 48 milliseconds per decompress, which is causing a lot of hitching. Um, but the, the key to all of this is because the decompressing is being done in JavaScript rather than being pushed off to the GPU, we have the ability to move the decompression off onto a worker. And now everything goes smooth. Uh, and you can see down at the bottom, we're getting this continuous set of zero millisecond uploads. 
and this is performing much better. Uh, we're not getting the issues that we had from JPEGs. Uh, there is still one outstanding issue here in that the EM script and build does tend to create a lot of garbage, and so the garbage collection cycles here are more expensive than they otherwise would have been with just native uh, JPEGs or PNGs. And that's what's causing any remaining hitches that you get here. You can connect each of those directly to a garbage collect cycle. But regardless, using the Crunch library in this particular scenario where we have a lot of texture streaming into the scene in real time proves to be a big win for performance and I encourage all of the rest of you to look into it as, um, as you can. Hey there, I'm Bill Baxter. Uh, I work for Google and this is James Darpinian. We're both uh, working on the Maps team, in particular on the Maps GL project, which is to re-implement our client uh, uh, using WebGL, which we have largely done. We uh, went uh, open to beta in October of last year, not too long after SIGGRAPH, so when we were here last time, we couldn't say anything about it. Uh, now we can. So it's live on the web right now. He's just going to maps.google.com. If you've seen this in the corner, uh, now you know what it is, click on that. It runs a little benchmark, it just finished it. it. Takes like two seconds to run a little benchmark to see if your computer is actually capable of rendering Maps GL. And once you're in, it switches over to the GL renderer. And so now uh, you'll have things like uh, smooth zooming of, of labels. If you notice as he zooms in and out, uh, the labels don't get pixelated and zoom up. We do a dynamic layout every frame uh, of the label placements, and so you see if you zoom in to, to places with um, curvy labels, you find any of those. That was slightly curvy, but anyway, we're, we're laying them out uh, using a very clever uh, fragment shader uh, on the fly. And yeah, there's some good ones there. So as you zoom in on those, if they don't collide with other labels and persist, You'll see they kind of snake along and, and zoom smoothly. Uh, if you go into some of the urban centers, you'll see one of the 3D features. You can, uh, can see some 3D buildings if you get into a uh, close enough zoom. And so these are now using some of the same data that's uh, surfaced in Google Earth. Some of the 3, 3D warehouse data. A lot of these are just 2D footprints, but um, certain difficult to model buildings like the, uh, the Space Needle or the Eiffel Tower or uh, it's the City Hall here. The Transamerica Pyramid doesn't work well as a, as a simple 2D footprint. Uh, it's extruded. Um, and if we go into satellite mode now, you'll see as we zoom in, we've had this oblique data for a while uh, that's captured by airplanes flying at low altitude. Um, you see this transition that's also done using WebGL, sort of smooth transition uh, from the obliques. We're also doing uh, depth reconstruction uh, using multi-view stereo to reconstruct some depth for these. So also, uh, one thing we can do with this is when we rotate, uh, the depth gives us a little way to give you some context as the buildings rot rotate around. Uh, and previously, we had this oblique data in the maps, um, but when you switch from heading to heading, it just sort of flips suddenly, and so you kind of lose, you become disoriented. And so it's a nice thing that WebGL allows us to do. Uh, if we switch to a nice tourist destination, like should we go over to Paris? Uh, the 3D model of this in the maps mode is pretty nice too. Nice thing there. And then uh, something we have integrated recently at these things called photo tours. And these, uh, there's some research about this at ICCP or ICCD, these vision conferences um, at Furukawa and uh, Samir Abawal. Um, basically what this is doing is taking <coughs> photos from the web, uh, just publicly available photos. You can see down in the lower left, it says what the source was for each photo. This, these are from Picasso, uh, and it just uses the geotags in them to to find a cluster of images that are all looking at the same famous monument, or Notre Dame in this case. And then they use uh, multi-view stereo to reconstruct 3D from all those uh, user images. And so we now have 
um, hundreds of these tours available for different locations around the world. And I think that's about it. I was gonna, I have a few slides that, that, that will be on the, on the wiki page about some of our development practices, just some, some basics of what we do. We have, uh, we use the closure library. We came up with this, um, this shader compiler that will minify your shaders and do some dead code elimination. And uh, it's also the one that Ben Bennick mentioned. He's using the same, the same one that, that we came up with. It's open source. Uh, you can find it as part of the GLSL unit project. And that's the other thing we have is some uh, uh, GLSL shader unit tests. Um, the compiler is part of that framework. And so we have regular unit tests, we have performance tests, we have rendering tests, uh, and we also have these shader unit tests, which is, which is something nice to have to make sure your shaders are doing what you think they're doing. People make changes. I have Street View too, yes, that was the other thing. So now the Street View is integrated completely in the WebGL. It doesn't require a separate plugin to render anymore um, because WebGL lets us do whatever we want. We have these nice swoop in and swoop out transitions. And so it's great. It's all in one package. It gives us a, a great platform for doing more interesting stylizations and things like that in the future um, to have a full 3D engine behind the, the maps. I work at Motorola Mobility, and it's a bit challenging to do a demo about what the file format accepts. It's a great, great, great demo, but anyway, we try to make it a bit fancy than usual file format things. So I work also with um, Chronos with the uh, Colada working group, and one of the discussion was to uh, bridge the gap between uh, WebGL and, and Colada. Um, so on one side you have Colada. Uh, which is uh, available and integrated in most of the uh, authoring tool. And on the, the other side, you have uh, WebGL, which is in, in many browsers. So many people have been uh, doing stuff to, uh, to, to bring a, a format or just importing directly Colada when the computer is uh, power, uh, has enough has power to do it. But most of the time, everybody ends up doing the same transformation uh, to, to bring uh, um, a model uh, inside uh, WebGL, like unifying indexes and all that. So why not uh, focusing on that effort in a single place and also taking advantage of uh, recent stuff in, um, um, connected to WebGL like type torrent. So why not describing just uh, all the scene uh, and the type array in the JSON file and use a binary blob on the side so you can have some good side effects stuff like uh, um, progressive loading and compression that I, I really want to integrate after I, uh, with one stuff from the side. So here is a demo. Here you see uh, a model which was loaded uh, progressively, but we, we can adapt thanks to the separation between JSON and the binary blob and, and load very slowly if, if we want to because of the, of, the, of the bandwidth. So it will appear progressively, but since you have the JSON already with all the information, you can choose the bonding boxes and have a, a much, much better feedback for, uh, feedback for, the, uh, for the user. So you can tweak the loading as much as you want. You have a lot of granularity within the format. Uh, you can point to a, a single blob to hold all your vertex and indices, and it's up to you if you want to declare them entirely or not. And if you want to, to just bind a single uh, index buffer and change the offset inside, it supports all that. There is some other example, but if, I, if I'm quicker, you have just a, a single request, and that's it. So that's, that's for the explanation of the basis of the, of the format, and I will let uh, Brandon talk about the, some uh, nice integration of it. All right. uh, so I've been working with Fabrice since he's been developing this format, and I think that there's a lot of potential for it. Uh, but if we want the format to catch on, obviously people have to be able to use it in uh, code bases that they're already familiar with. 
and 3JS at the moment is the de facto uh, place that people go to to start working with WebGL. So uh, this is not nearly as impressive as my last demo, sorry. But um, in this case, we uh, we are showing uh, just a simple Colada duck, the hello world of Colada that's being uh, it's been transformed through Fabrice's tool and is being loaded up in uh, in 3JS. So of course, we've got you know the basic shadow and lighting in here. It integrates very very nicely with that. And that in and of itself isn't really all that impressive because 3JS does have quite a few other model formats that it supports, including Colada itself. Uh, the big thing that we want to try and stress here is that the, this is one of the first formats that's really truly been designed. Uh, for the web from the get-go, and so there's a lot of um, a lot of nice things that may trickle down through into loaders for other uh, frameworks like this. This is built using the um, the same basic loading framework that Fabrice was using for his demo, and um, as they're very generalized libraries, and as such as the format itself, the the libraries around that evolve. This can evolve nicely along with it. Uh, we should be able to pull over the benefits of the streaming um, that's inherent in this format in 3JS, so you can have that nice streaming effect that the brief was showing. Um, and uh, overall, it's just it's a very nice format. Once once we are able to consider getting some of the binary uh, compression in there and whatnot, it should load. Uh, I would imagine faster than just about any of the other formats that are available to 3JS right now. So it's still a work in progress, but um, I'm personally really excited to see where we can go with it, and hopefully we can get it off the ground. I'm Fabien Sayer, I'm a PhD student to Lyon. I think you can hear that. Lyon is uh, in France, in fact. I work on something which is uh, the geoportail for uh, IGN, Institut Géographique Insular Français and uh, at the score line, you can search on Google uh, Geoportail uh, and you have some uh, demonstration. And the problem is, you, if I speak about uh, Google Map, I think uh, you know the Google Map and Google Earth. And the problem is, uh, each of our clients have its own reprojection to, to do 2D with 3D. So if we want to have Google Earth with 2D data, we have many problems. And we try to do all the raw projection from 2D, 3D, 2D, and so, and so on directly in the web browser. And we have some results. So if you want to, to see, you have some results on YouTube, and the name is OpenScape.gl. So you can see that with an integrated chipset, you have some good results with, uh, open, with OpenScape.gl and with WebGL. So all the information is 2D information, and uh, to be compliant with smartphone, for example, we've done all the raw projection in JavaScript and with WebGL. And uh, after that, uh, it's just uh, like a Google Earth. You can uh, so interactive chipset is not very okay. That's all. Hi, I'm Jeff Bennett. I'm from Exocortex. Um, we're the ExoCortex team. We uh, help artists achieve their artistic vision. Um, so we've been doing this for quite some time. Um, we've had a lot of success at doing this. Uh, let's see. Uh, this is just some of my images we've done. We usually do high-end VFX, so we helped out uh, our clients with Avengers, Harry Potter, The Amazing Spider-Man, Titanic 3D, uh, just recently. Um, so we understand this space, and we, we understand the tools. But I guess one day uh, we're thinking, well, could we make some of these tools in the browser? Um, with WebGL, it might actually be possible. So we, we thought about it, we did a lot of design, we did a lot of research, and I'm going to show you what we came up with. So this is um, from our professional background. Um, sorry, I'm nervous, but. So one, two, three, there we go. So this is a professional grade tool. Um, it's extensible. It's uh, we already have uh, third-party developers developing for it. Let me just show you. Everything here is a plugin. Um, all the commands are plugins. All of these primitives are plugins. We have lights. Um, I'm a programmer. I'm going to make some programmer art and show you how it works. I apologize. It can actually be better than this. Just give me a moment. Hands a little shaking here. Here's a sphere. Um, we can come over to the operators. You can see that it's generative. This is a generative framework. 
written fully in web standards. I'm going to reduce the subdivisions here so we can see it. Let's drop this down from realistic to wireframe. Um, I'm going to reduce it even further. Apologies, I'm actually quite ready. I'm not good at this. Um, let's bring this actually full screen here. We can see that's pretty reduced. One thing that artists often do is they want to do something called subdivision services. You'll actually notice this is not a triangle mesh, this is actually a quad mesh that you're doing here. Um, I'm going to come here, I'm going to actually add a modifier. We're going to go subdivide. We're going to add that to the stack. Now we're going to increase the subdivision. It's actually really quick. This is great. Like, I didn't know web technology could do this. Um, and then, uh, yeah, let's see. I could add a camera. Actually, no, let's just go to the next one. So here's the Clada duck. We imported this. Um, and you can see that we've got material support. Um, this time it's actually a tri-mesh that we're supporting. Um, let's, um, actually, this is not that interesting. Let's go to the next one. Here's a tiger. Um, here's, here's a car. This is actually a really high model, and we're actually going past the, we're actually going past the um, index buffer limit because there are only 16-bit index buffers, but we, we have technology to go past that without using any extensions because we want to stay as, as confined within the base standard as possible. Um, and actually, this is really performant. Like, things are fast. Um, here is a Buddha. So in this case, we have uh, many of these uh, DCC tools will have a default light at the viewport. We have a default light here. This is being lit in real time. I'm going to push the middle mouse button. Sometimes it makes me go back. Go back. There we go. OK, so this does work. You can see the highlights are changing. And I went back, of course. <laughs> Sorry, let's go forward. I'm actually going to reload that. One, two, three. It's very quick. We have been really working on, on uh, performance. I'm going to reload the Buddha. So what's nice is this is not only a DCC tool, but we can design it within the, the philosophy of Google Docs. So we do have all of our changes are streamable to um, a web server. Uh, we're running on Node.js. Uh, so if we want to do, say, iterative uh, uh, rendering, we can actually be sending those changes back to the server, invalidating that part of the scene, and then re-rendering. So we can have live updating very quickly. Um, let's actually go, so we've been, this is actually um, from Mozilla. So um, Mozilla really likes this uh, because uh, it fits within their um, HTML5 games. Because not only can we do VFX production with this, but we can also do um, uh, game bug creation. So I'm going to bring up something that they put together. It's got the credits here for it. Uh, and this is a really large flat file we're recording, but it actually came in relatively quickly. We've got a full level here. I can, uh, I make program art, so I usually destroy levels. Let me just change this. Now it's ugly. We can make it uglier. Um, we can change after that material property. I can come down. But everything is extensible. Like we're just, this is just the start. We're making that ugly. Let's make this ugly. Let's, uh, I got keyboard shortcuts working, so we're just going to take this. Move things around. I'm going to scale it horribly. It's pretty ugly. Um, yeah, so uh, there's a lot more. Um, I'm not showing you everything. But I'm probably out of time. But here's my information. Uh, ben Houston, email me or check out our website. But this is not public. This is the first time we've ever shown it. Uh, I think it, it can really be a game changer. Thank you. So um, again, I'm Ron. Kristen told already about this crazy group that tries to get 3D directly into HTML. And I'm one of these guys. And my name is Johannes Bär and a couple, a couple of other people uh, worked or they refined the binary uh, encoding we're working on for the Freedom System we uh, they were last year and we improved a couple of numbers so we are really down to about fixed, uh, usually 5 bytes uh, per triangle and even improved the, uh, the size of, of data we can actually handle. So well, that's a 10 billion polygon model. Uh, we can see a screen to the system. But that's not the only thing we're working on. Um, one of the interesting parts is uh, level of detail. So we can do progressive refinement now on our data type. And the really interesting part is that we not even have to stream uh, a byte to the system to be really useful. So look closely, it's a little bit fast, but uh, you can see how the object refine while they're loading. And the whole thing works uh, utilizing web browsers and transferables. So it's really neat that in the web browser actually the packages are built and then the final array packages are handed over to the rendering stack. So again, for example, this landing gear. 
which also is about 350, 500 uh, million. But again, the famous Buddha, which uh, is true, is a lot of So LOD is something we are working on. It's really nice. But, uh, and the final thing I would like to show is the idea of this priority paste rendering. The idea is that we have all these hundreds of links to external binary packages that we stream to the system. And there's a, a nice little heuristic that decides what action should be screened. So what's in the view, first them larger ports, stuff that it's important for the application so you can get some semantic thing. But now we even support that we do external decisions on this uh, um, to decide what system should be loaded or what patches should be loaded next. And here's a little diagram. There's a uh, a culling server and an asset server involved and Carsten in the back he is a uh, uh, he's actually uh, the culling server right now and we are render uh, 80 million original 80 million polygon model original BMW car model uh, directly here in the browser so it can really go inside and the system pages new data uh, to the client so this shows how fast the patient is. So on the one hand side, the level of detail is really neat because it is for slow connections, really redefines data. On the other hand, the data packages are really so fast that we can page we are around four or five so, uh, million polygons uh, to the system instantly. Okay, so much about the refined binary package. Okay, so I'm Luis Cabongo, I come from Wicom Tech. I work in the private research center in the north of Spain. And if I can get the projector to work, I will show you what we do. Okay, there we go. So last year we presented work on volume rendering based on WebGL. So basically, in simple words, what we did is, instead of having a huge volume loaded into a 3D texture, which is really not uh, going to work with WebGL, we patched all the different slices with a single texture. So we were able to achieve this kind of volume rendering by doing by implementing the corresponding shaders. So this is a black and white volume rendering. Each value of the of the volume is actually uh, addressed a gray level, which is the original value. But we could also think on uh, transferring these values into colors into a color scale system like this. So this is a 3D volume rendering with ray casting. And we have a transfer function which tries to represent in red the soft tissues and in white and yellow we have the, the hard tissues. Sorry for that. The next one is not going to work. Okay. Uh, and what we have done this year is we worked on in, uh, implementing this with an extra DOM, which Johan has just talked about right now. So basically, the code is available online so you can start uh, playing with the volume rendering and uh, doing your own, uh, your own code with this. And uh, one of the cool features of this is that we can uh, actually, instead of uh, mapping this uh, texture, which is a static value texture, uh, to, the, to the volume rendering, we have, by very simply changing a tag within the definition of this web page, we have uh, connected it to, um, to a video. So actually now the colors are changing in real time based on, a, on the colors integrated within the video in the video image. Okay, so it's very a powerful, very powerful tool. So I encourage you to check this out. Now I wanted to show you this demo, but it apparently crashed just right now. Sorry. So I'm gonna skip to the next one. Okay. So this is x 3 dom again, so this time we have a 3D model which has been loaded also in the scene and we are mixing volume rendering within the scene, so actually we have implemented also an interface in which the user can come and start changing the intensity of the different values so you can see how the, the values are slowly added, of course this is interactive and we have several volumes loaded so we can actually think on uh, switching between different time steps and it loads immediately. So this is very, very, very simple to implement within X2DOM thanks to the different developments that we have been doing this year. 
And the last demo I wanted to show you is actually uh, an OpenGL ES2 proxy for Open Scene Graph. So actually you, the basic idea is that you can implement your Open Scene Graph within C++ and, uh, and make it compatible with OpenGL ES2. And then uh, with uh, our solution you can actually uh, have a web interface directly on this. Maybe the demo is still loaded so I can just show you quickly. Okay, so this was the idea. This is a navigation through the San Sebastian city. Uh, we don't have our uh, work on our office on the map, but I wanted to show you. So sorry for that. And finally, I would like to thank all my colleagues. No. Okay. So I can't thank my colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> all credits to me. Okay. This is another demo. You see the video? Okay, this is uh, supposed to mock up a little bit what uh, NASA has been doing in ocean flow visualization. Of course, it's not as nice, but this is all working on, on WebGL. The only thing here is that the, the computation is done on the server, and thanks to the open scene graph uh, technology that I just talked about, we are able to pre-compute some information on the server and then show it like this on, on the web. So, that's it. My name is Doug, this is Tiago uh, from the company Tima. We're also working, uh, like most of you, on doing really useful tools in the browser, and we think like Ben that uh, WebGL progress to the point where you can now do real production tools uh, in the browser. So things that were formerly done uh, are limited to something like a Google Docs, we think you can now uh, start servicing the uh, real content creation space. So what we're showing here is a, a project browser that we have built into the application. We are running off the cloud. Uh, directly, so we don't know if we're going to have any, any uh, bandwidth issues. So that's why I'm holding the backup laptop in my hand. So yeah, to that's have, as well, so. yeah, I'm also limited by the screen. So what you have here is a browser for content that was previously uh, created using the application, and Tiago is opening up the scene. We can talk a lot about the geometries that we support these type of rates that once to be here. I think a lot of us hit the same problems in terms of how to get a performing 3D model on WebGL, and it sounds like a lot of people have solved it. The same way we did with the background web worker, we use type the rays so that the geometries uh, move fast in the WebGL viewport. Like Ben, we implement the multiple viewports, um, even though you only have one GL context. So it's Sorry, like, I have many projects, I can choose one. <laughs> <laughs> so really the goal uh, with our application is to get something useful at the end. So we, we did implement a WebGL, a WebGL viewer, so you see here we have a light bulb. So maybe it's not the most uh, complex, the most complex model, but anyways, uh, it's um, going to show you. Yeah, so about. what you have here is just a 3D geometry, actually a few pieces of it. And um, so the viewport just shows me uh, the, the meshes and the things there to see. The collaborators in the bottom is because the application is actually collaborative. And that's why the name of the company is TeamUp. <laughs> we, we have various uh, light sources and uh, it's really like a professional proof of rendering. So here I'm going to move uh, the light around so you just see the gel, it looks uh, okay. I'd like you, you, you have been doing shaders and you could have done pretty amazing shaders in gel. But uh, for professional content, we got to have a high quality rendering and that's why we, we implemented this technology for rendering. Uh, since we're running out of our cloud here and I can't, I can't really trust the internet connection, so based on the other presentations, uh, I'll try to run another scene. Or you can just pop it. Yeah, sure. okay. So I have a library of models on the left that I can just drag and drop in the scene and interactively do it. Uh, we have uh, cameras, uh, light sources, and, and the rendering technology in the back end. Oh, yeah. And it's there. So the emphasis uh, for us was us on creating uh, complex models in GL. Uh, to represent this material, but rather to develop complex models on the server, which is what you're seeing here, uh, and give just the uh, instantaneous feedback that you need to have a nice client application. So we think WebGL is amazing for that. It allows us to get a really good user experience, but still provide something of a really high quality and something that's production uh, from our back. So there are some materials, the, what you're seeing is, a, is an optical-based uh, rendering solution. So we have materials that are physically based materials that represent uh, gold, that represent uh, car paint, that represent a lot of a 
lot of different materials that are traditionally harder to get with an approximative approach. So I think that's uh, something that's a little bit unique with the application that we've developed is that we've, we're really trying to blend the best of both worlds. So get that, that instantaneous feedback that WebGL provides, which was not possible even a couple of years ago, um, and also provide something that, that is really, really useful to the production community, which is, which is somewhere where WebGL is, is still developing. So we have we have various uh, assets from the left uh, that we have pre-rendered before. I can also show you that for our, our 2D image um, that they're just saved on the cloud. So after you finish the rendering, you can just save one of these high-resolution images and apply specific features and techniques to them. Um, again, I can't open the scene now uh, because uh, I think we have been very low internet connection. I'm just hoping to see the models right now. Uh, for, the, for the materials, we have a series of physically based and accurate materials such as uh, BTS, PRES, PSES, BCS, all the apps that were invented before. Um, the materials are based on, on measured data that we actually measure in the lab. And we have a total uh, editing application in the front end that just uses WebGL. So it allows the user to, to place the objects uh, however they want and collaborate with, with their clients or their peers. So right now you see the image is completely converged. Uh, it's just like a really smooth uh, shading. I could I could add a different material and decide to edit that, and that could be added to the same scene at the same time as well, which is one of the biggest features of uh, collaboration because it's traditionally difficult to share any of these assets. So even if we build like an 80 million polygon uh, mesh that lives in the browser, you have to provide a high resolution image at the end. So that's why we provide real time. Um, uh, editing with, uh, with the rendering in the backend. The mesh isn't super interesting, so I, I apologize for the for the lack of interesting meshes. <laughs> um, we have we had a car uh, on this other scene that we're rendering with a simple car paint as well, and this is it's more like what it looks like to you. when you save it. Uh, this is uh, production quality rendering, and it was made under 20 seconds uh, directly on the cloud, so no one had to actually buy a computer or spend any time um, trying to create a, a carpet shader when the actually we just measured them in a lab and we take directly from, from the industry leaders uh, all this data that's measured and we make it available in the browser. Traditionally this data would take forever for someone to get their hands on because it's, um, it's something that's normally um, produced and it's very cost, costly to produce. So what we do, uh, here's some other examples. Um, this is hair rendering, which is kind of funny because it's very hard to achieve hair rendering. This would be impossible to achieve in WebGL alone, so we just show a, a proxy match in WebGL, which is very fast. And then we, we use the GL drawing buffer to just show the final results of the image and allow directly editing it. Uh, this is uh, skin shaders and hair shaders as well. Um, here's a volumetric cloth model, which is traditionally also very complex to render, and, and they produce uh, these things based on normally on the surface, just like a unique surface, and we're trying to make this really a volumetric representation because the medium is actually has a, a thickness that uh, the light passes through. So we, we just study all these properties of light, and we try to enable it. You're done. All right. Thank you. Thank you.